So good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us for our special Zoom panel presentation called Understanding Santa Barbara's Historic Resource Guidelines. My name is Sarah Feninga. I'm the Director of Programs here at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. The trust stewards the past and present of the Presidio neighborhood and inspires preservation advocacy throughout the county in order to create a more vibrant community. I would like to begin our program this evening by offering some helpful Zoom webinar tips. Our presentation this evening will be closed captioned with subtitles for the convenience of our audience members who are hearing impaired. You can locate the controls to turn on or turn off subtitles in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen. It is a CC icon that you can click on to get a drop down menu with options. If you do not see the CC icon, click on the more icon, which is the three dots, and you should see the option there. This presentation will be recorded and will be made available on our YouTube page um, and the trust website probably next week. During the presentations, you can ask your questions using the Zoom chat function or by submitting them to our panelists using the Q&A function and both tabs are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. After the presentations, the panelists are going to come together and answer some of your questions. Unfortunately, we will probably not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will do our best to address as many as we can. For those that are just joining, thank you once again for coming this evening to our special panel presentation and discussion. As we begin this program, we want to acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our region. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all Indigenous people have shown worldwide. We are on the traditional territory of the Chumash peoples. Now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our panelists this evening. Anthony Grumbein is a principal architect at Harrison Design and specializes in the architecture of Santa Barbara. He's the current chair of the City of Santa Barbara's Historic Landmarks Commission and the current president of Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation's Board of Directors. Nicole Hernandez is the City of Santa Barbara's architectural historian. She worked as an architectural historian for five years at Historic Denver and four years for the city of New Orleans before coming to join the city of Santa Barbara in 2012. Cassandra Ensberg is a Santa Barbara based architect at Ensberg Jacobs Design and she served as president of the Architectural Foundation of Santa Barbara from 2014 to 2015, is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, a recipient of the AIASB 2020 Luda Marie Riggs Medal and a new commissioner on the Historic Landmarks Commission. She devotes much of her time and service to the community to educate about the essential role of art in design and architecture. So we're going to kick off this presentation with a poll question. Give me a moment to pull up this poll. All right, we've launched the poll. So why did you register and come to this panel presentation? We'll give everyone a minute to respond. Oh, there we go. Thanks for your comment. Now you can see him. We just cut off the poll answers that we didn't want to hear, right? All right, we got a lot of folks just wanting to learn more in general. Sounds good. 
wanting to learn about the process for creating a successful project. You're here for the Cliffs Notes, don't want to read the entire guidelines. And we got a couple people here wanting some brownie points from Anthony and Cass or Nicole support on their projects. All right. All right. So Anthony, I'm gonna turn Great. it over to you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so thank you all for coming and welcome. Um, and so uh, as uh, I'm gonna put my uh, Santa Barbara Trust hat on as a president um, and to welcome you all, uh, the trust has been uh, as part of the mission to uh, be part of the conversation and to help facilitate uh, good conversations around historic uh, preservation and just an understanding of the past as we go forward to the future. Um, for those of you who don't know that much about the trust, they run, uh, there's a lot of various things they do, but they run the Presidio Spanish Fort downtown Santa Barbara, as well as number, managing a number of other properties in the downtown, uh, including Casa de la Guerra um, and the museum space there and other, and other things. And so it's part of the trust mission uh, to host events such as this. And we've been doing so um, for a long time. Uh, one of the last big ones, or one, one of the last big ones from a couple decades ago was um, the Plaza de la Guerra uh, Symposium, which has um, also been an inspiration for some of the recent last couple of years, number of symposiums that we've held and discussions that we've held on uh, these and many other topics. So um, for those of you uh, who um, would like to know more, you can contact the trust. And uh, with that, we're happy to partner with the city um, in this discussion um, about the guidelines. And uh, those of you uh, who want to know more about the guidelines, the guidelines recently now passed um, this last year, um, thanks to, well, but they've been a long, long time coming. It's been over 10, 12 years of effort to get to this point. Um, and, um, and so we're very happy uh, with them coming forth and, and being official now. And so we, this is a great opportunity to kind of walk people through them, uh, talk about what they are, um, and kind of give a little overview and then have any discussions on it. So that's kind of our, our overarching. I'm gonna do a little screen share here. Um, and um, sorry, I am um, as a historic landmarks commission, I'm very low tech, so I'm slow in this. Okay, here we go. All right, so, um, so with with that, the historic guidelines is the document, but the, it really is um, really a, a, a it's the document that gets used by the Historic Landmarks Commission, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is, what our our, our role is at the Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, but first, I wanted to kind of step back even further and say, what is a review board? The Historic Landmarks Commission is one particular review board in Santa Barbara for the downtown and for historic structures. Uh, but what is a review board in general? And so review boards in general are have traditions across the United States and, and elsewhere, um, and they're a way of, of having review for projects. But this also connects to as architects know, um, as they're trained in landscape architects and others, designers, um, it's part of the design process is to have your design reviewed um, and to give feedback on it and to sometimes take that feedback and either augment your design or to um, come up with different solutions. And so it's part of that, the, the long tradition within the design world of review and of, um, and of development of projects. So um, for our review board now, um, the, uh, the, the Historic Landmarks Commission or HLC, um, so as a particular review board, these are, and this is found at the beginning of our guidelines, uh, these are sort of um, the big picture zoom out goals and uh, sort of the, the call, the the charge that the um, Historic Landmarks Commission is set with, this is what, what we're supposed to be doing for the city. Um, and this is established um, in ordinances and, and, and has its, um, also its life in the charter. So, uh, so, it's, so it's ingrained in the city now. So uh, some of the things that we do on this list is, and I highlighted some of the key ones were protection of landmarks. And we'll talk about what is a historic landmark. Um, uh, the uh, development um, and the El Pueblo Viejo or EPV is the, the downtown core and we'll take a look at a map of that. Um, but it's really the development, um, make sure the development within the El Pueblo Viejo is sensitive to neighboring historic resources, uh, styles within historic districts and reflects unique and established architectural and landscape traditions. 
to ensure that they are integrated into a specific cultural landscape. So into the, it, its location in the city and, and the sort of uniqueness of its, of its location. So that's part of it. Um, also to item E here, civic pride in the beauty of the city and the accomplishments of its past. Um, so we look, we look and want to promote those, those good things of that. Um, and F, to strengthen the economy and vitality of the city by protecting and enhancing the city's attractions to residents, tourists, and visitors. So really, it's kind of keeping the, the city of Santa Barbara at this very high caliber that it's known for. It's, it's not just national, it's internationally known. It's one of the very uh, high draw cities um, from all over the world that people come here because of its beauty um, and people come here and stay here as well as residents. And so it's kind of trying to keep our, our um, uh, you know, keep that bar really high. Um, and then the, uh, we, it goes on. So uh, in H, we see a stabilize and improve property values within the city. So there's also an aspect of, of good stewardship and um, keeping the quality of life. So um, we also under I designate a city historic resource. So uh, historic resources and whether they're landmarks or structures of merit or um, on the inventory, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, um, that our designation is, is part of our, our duty. Um, and then to promote high standards in architectural and landscape design. Um, and then in K, to ensure appropriate, and this is what becomes a big one, and we'll talk about this more as well later, uh, to ensure appropriate building massing, including size, mass, bulk, height, and scale in relationship to its site location and surrounding neighborhood. So really it's how the building or the proposed building fits within its neighborhood and how it's responding to its particularities of that neighborhood. And then it's to also to promote neighborhood compatibility as part of that is to be thinking of what works with this particular neighborhood in this particular location. And then um, M to encourage high standards of livability of projects and safety of residents. So it's not even just the aesthetics and just things look beautiful, but also making sure that it's livable, um, walkable, livable, um, pedestrian friendly and people friendly, um, and then also safe for its residents. Um, and then finally, uh, fa uh, fair and consistent both in policy and implementation. So part of this is making sure that we are fair and, and um, you know, sort of judge the, the design by the, the qualities of design over and over and it doesn't matter who's doing it or where it's being done, we're, we're, we keep that bar high for everyone. Um, and so that kind of is, is our overview of our charge of what HLC is sort of at the heart of HLC and what we're looking for as the commissioners when we review projects. Um, so then this, with this map here, um, this on the right here shows, and I'll use a little annotation tool to mark some things here. Um, so this, you know, the pink outline here um, around this, that's the, the El Pueblo Viejo, that's the downtown portion. And then also in El Pueblo Viejo, and you can see State Street right here, all the way out to Stearns Wharf as the sort of spine uh, organization of the, of the city and the density. And then there's also this area up here with the mission area. And so these, these regions are all part of um, any, any project within those regions are gonna go to uh, HLC as the design review body. Um, and then um, and this is a map that our office did to kind of show that looking at the, the density of these buildings down here and how those, that, that's, those are the major and you know, more commercial and mixed use, but just more dense and, and solid. Um, and that also highlights uh, the, um, uh, the, the various historic buildings, whether it's the Presidio, um, Spanish, you know, Spanish period, or the Victorians, um, or the Spanish colonial revival. Um, and so uh, depending on all these, all, all the various styles that have been within our, our city, um, that's also an important part of the fabric. So whether it's the particular buildings that are outside of the El Pueblo Viejo, that are outside of this region here, or, um, or those within it, we're, we're looking at both of those. Um, and so for the last one slide here, um, sorry, I'm still in annotate mode here. Let me go on now here. I'll close this out to you. Let's see. Okay. And then this last slide kind of shows a zoom in view. So as you notice, there's a lot of buildings downtown uh, within the El Pueblo Viejo 
but that are not actually um, that are not actually you know highlighted here, or, or and they're not because they're not historic. They're not um, they're not historic buildings. So um, those buildings would be held to the El Pueblo Viejo design guideline standards, uh, which are standard of sort of general Spanish colonial revival, and there's some other um, you know sort of cousins. Uh, but uh, at, that's the design style within this area. But then all the buildings outside of it as well that are, that are highlighted, those are all identified on a historic inventory or historic resource list. And um, so those would also come before us. Most of those are single families, uh, single family homes, um, or at least once were. And, um, and so that most of those structures outside of the core are, um, are, are, that are historic would be um, single family homes that are coming to us. So that is sort of the, the big picture overview um, of what HLC is, um, and let me just stop sharing here now. Um, and so then now, um, Cass Ensberg is going to go through some of the inspirations of Santa Barbara and what makes it special. And then Nicole Hernandez, um, as the city historian, is going to take a fly, sort of fly through view of the guidelines to get you kind of familiar with it. And then I'll circle back with some of the uh, sort of things that we regularly see with HLC uh, that are both uh, pro problematic or process oriented that might be helpful tips and tricks uh, for, and for the process and then we'll go to questions after that. So that's kind of our general structure um, for the evening. So Cass, do you like to take it away from here? Hey, thank you, Anthony. I shall uh, attempt to do the, the sharing part here. Yeah, uh, looking good. So far, so good. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who is here this evening. Uh, we've been working on this for a while and are really uh, happy to be able to be here with all of you to um, share this information. Um, and I especially appreciate uh, Sarah and Kevin and Nicole and Anthony uh, as our team to put all this together. Um, I have uh, the easy job, which is to um, share a whole bunch of really beautiful pictures. So I um, wanted to give an overview reminder for all of us why Santa Barbara is such a special place to live. And I think it's always a good thing to um, sort of step back and take in the big picture. There's so much that we um, can be grateful and, and um, appreciative of that we live in this amazing place. Um, so to do that, I put together this PowerPoint. It's kind of like a scrapbook of our city. There's about 20 slides and I've just jammed as much information on as each one just to be a sampling of all the greatness, the beauty, the creativity that Santa Barbara is at its very core. Um, I'm pretty sure all these slides are gonna be very familiar um, to you all. And if you see something you don't know, then you can get out there and find it. Um, we have so much uh, rich detail. I also wanna just underscore that there are there's so much talent in this city and so many examples that there's, every one of these slides could have about 40 more with tons of information. So this is just a broad brush and I don't at all mean to um, forget anyone because I know it takes the village and every single one of uh, our community is important. So um, uh, starting with this slide, um, you know, why, why is this such an extraordinary place? Um, we are a city of nature, romantic beauty, art, culture, and design excellence. We are we are framed by the ocean on the one side and the mountains on the other. And uh, we are, um, have a built environment that is um, made up of world-class architecture. This is my, my dog who just recently passed away. So I have him there for, for his remembrance. Um, this slide is just, um, Again, a, the, a map, simple map here from Google Earth. There we are, here's Santa Barbara. And here are some older images that are from um, very, very old historic uh, images. This is uh, the Adobe over at the um, um, 
historical museum and this incredible, beautiful patio um, of DG out in front. And I, I hope you've all had a chance to be at an, a, a delightful evening there. Um, of course, here's the Presidio in the lower left. This is a picture of an owl was visiting at the Natural History Museum. They bring in the uh, rags for people to see. So this is a great horned owl. We have a, quite a few of them around our area over here. And then um, here's an example of an old um, mural of tile that uh, we see a lot of that are wonderful uh, ways of telling our story. Here's the Stegosaurus wall um, at the Natural History Museum. And then here again, this map, um, Nicole will talk about I, I wanted to have here just so we could all remember how fortunate we are um, to, to not have uh, our, El, our El, El Poyejo is right in us. It's around us every single day. We get to use these buildings. They are functioning buildings. And so no matter where you live in Santa Barbara, we all get to enjoy the spectacular views um, as we city. There's so much inspired by just driving by um, or visiting or going to the recorder's office or going about your business. All of these uh, wonderful old structures um, that were designed in a classical um, plan, uh, the gardens, the Passe plazas, and all the new interpretation of Santa Barbara theme. Um, so the, the historic treasures are to inspire our future, and the, and we're so fortunate. So I just want to you know make um, here are some images of the downtown. We're in the El Pueblo Viejo here, and I'm sure you all recognize where where I am. The uh, to my back is City Hall. Um, this is the um, the um, Ana Capa side of um, uh, El Paseo, and here's the State Street side, the famous Paseoing in that we all love so much and um, other historic buildings around and then newer ones inspired by these older ones. So we see, you know, the circulation. We have a true downtown, a beautiful older building that's a, a retail store. So of course, um, the, our, I'm just gonna go a number of our key, you know, really important buildings. The monumental public architecture we have is just, uh, world class. So here's an example of how, you know, the courthouse, the sunken gardens is used every single day for so many things, weddings, um, gatherings, um, films in the summer by the Arts Commission. Uh, this is actually our architecture here. And then that fa fantastic gate that is just so powerful and the beautiful fountain at the front. And um, if that weren't enough, then all of this glorious um, detail, artistry, craft that, that is the courthouse is just covered toe with that tells our story. So this is, the, this is our story and every building tells a story. So it's so important that they be designed well and that they uh, speak to the people and tell our story. Here's the Arlington Theater, another incredibly iconic building with this fabulous Paseo on the back side that I hope will get more uh, reinvigorated as we move forward with the work that the city's doing now with the master planning work. Um, our beautiful, you know, front marquee out in front. Um, this incredible door on the back side that goes into the stage area, and then of course the interior. And um, I wish I could have put the ceiling of the um, and the the interior of the theater itself, which is so fun and magical. Um, here's a just a bit on the Lobero Theater. Um, the of course you're not seeing the proscenium behind here, but just the this inc this fantastic door that goes into the stage from Anna Kappa side here the sketch kind of shows the scale of it and this also of course and then um, this beautiful wrought iron seahorse that is um, a detail on that um, kiosk out in front of the Libero theater 
Here's the San Marcos building, another fantastic treasure with this um, beautiful cast stone detailing all around it. And of course it's a building that's a, a donut shape. So you go inside here and there's a beautiful uh, courtyard um, inside uh, that the building is surrounding, but um, another fantastic um, Santa Barbara building. Um, here's the old mission um, on a day that I just happened to be by there and there were these horses out there in front on the, on the grassy area by the Rose Garden. I just thought that was so fantastic. I wish this was an everyday occurrence. Um, and of course we have the Imad Nari Street Painting Festival every year that is, just draws thousands of people um, to celebrate art and to be um, in this, this incredible backdrop that we have our built environment in Santa Barbara is so spectacular. It's, it's everything you, you know, if you're making a movie, you have to make a set, you have to build it. We have everything here, just the most beautiful spaces. Um, around us all the time in the outdoor rooms that we're so fortunate to use because of our mild climate. Here's uh, some examples of around the Presidio neighborhood. Here's the beautiful Presidio um, that the trust does such a great job of taking care of. And um, around the corner uh, the, and across the street, the main post office with, uh, this is just a detail of that side door with this beautiful um, relief. Um, and of course the inside of the post office is also as um, awe inspiring with all the work of decoration from the WPA period. And then over here we have the Baylor building that is um, to the back. I think you can kind of just see a little bit of it over here in the corner uh, behind the, uh, to the Presidio. Um, and just one of our favorite buildings was designed by Julia Morgan and uh, just has the most um, sensitive um, uh, fenestration and proportions and detailing. And it's one that we are often looking at as we're uh, looking at um, adding new buildings for residential. And then of course, there's the magical landscape architecture and gardens in Santa Barbara. This, uh, the Lotus Land is of course just one example, but just a fantastic world-class, um, I don't even have the words to describe how Lotus Land is. So full of art, so full of creativity, so magical in every way. So this is one that also inspires us, um, you know, the broader community as well, and brings people from all over the world to visit Santa Barbara. As Anthony said, you know, we have, we have a high bar. Um, again, here's the, as I was talking about our backdrop, you know, this is the San Marcos building and here we have the, the Fiesta, Fiesta, Viva La Fiesta parade. Here's the Dons marching. Here's my mother over here. And this celebration of everyone in the street where they can come from both sides of the city, come together on State Street and celebrate in this way that we have done for, for, as is our tradition. And then over here on the right, you see the um, um, also incredibly creative uh, solstice parade that we all just uh, love every single year. Um, few uh, slides on uh, our deep, deep heritage and rich heritage of art and culture. Um, these are some paintings of, um, just a few, we have so, so, so many amazing painters and artists in this town. I'm just showing a few here that I could get a hold of in some of my favorites. Uh, Ray Strong here, uh, Channing Peak here, uh, Phoebe Brunner. This is a, a mural that she painted over in the funk zone that's really fun. Uh, this is the mural that's on the backside of the Granada building, it was originally designed to be on the wall over at the um, San Marcos building. Uh, and there are several more panels that go with it, but it's over on the, um, this and several of the panels are on the backside of the uh, Granada garage now. And then this fantastic painting over at Ortega Park by Manuel Unsuega, Unsueta, sorry, Unsueta. Um, 
other examples of more creative artistry. This is one of my favorites. Uh, you have to go find it. It's the Zorro light fixture by architect Mark Shields, who's just brilliant and did this fantastic little um, uh, detail. Um, and then of course we have these fantastic gates. This just shows a small piece of it. It has another whole part over here and around the corner, it's just morphing all over and it's just fantastic. And this is designed, this is at the Community Arts Workshop designed by David Shelton. Um, here's an example of that beautiful, um, again, sort of a deco uh, design at the, co at the post office. And then this was uh, showing how we, everything connects to everything else. And this is the Arlington Theater where um, an art project was done by the Arts um, Commission to uh, honor the service providers. It's called the Blue Light Art Project and several buildings around town were lit up with blue light. Okay, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. Um, more details. Um, Moxie this is a new, newer building, but inspired by some of our historic. And it's a wonderful addition to Santa Barbara and for um, exploration of science and all kinds of things. Um, this is my favorite blue vase that's over there behind the post office in the El Presidio little plaza there. Um, here's a newer building, the Harbor View Inn, where they've you know brought in some uh, mosaic work and tile on the stairs and some color and some nice um, uh, design of the building. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, here's the very fun Jeff Shelton mosaic rugs hanging over the, the balcony wall. And these are some winding stairs over at Casa del Herrero. And, oh, finally, I bet you don't know where this is. This used to be Dana's Toys, which used to be where uh, Cadario is now. And this was a, a neon light that used to be there. Um, entries, gardens patios and passages. Hey, we live outside. We have the best climate ever, right? So we want to be outside and we have, um, we celebrate the, the gardens and the entries. Um, this is the George Washington Smith house uh, with the wall around and the bougainvillea, beautiful. And then just some other examples of other um, doorways, entries and portals. Um, this is a great example of a success story where we were an older building and a new, this is a new apartment building. Um, and Nicole will get into this detail about this one, but it's a very beautiful, uh, well done project. Good example of how to be successful. Um, and then here's a accessory dwelling unit, a new building, a new accessory dwelling unit. And here's an old historic um, residence, Spanish style in Santa Barbara that was restored. Um, uh, some more examples of, you know, restore the old, inspire the new. That's the most su sustainable way. This is a, um, a remodel of a, an older Spanish style house. This is an addition on the top of this um, craftsman. And here's the uh, incredible El P Casario. Uh, downtown, which is just a great example of living downtown. Uh, so with that, I think I'm just going to say that there's plenty to be inspired by. If you can't find something to be inspired by here in Santa Barbara, then you must be doing something wrong. So be inspired and, and take joy in all that we have. Preserve Santa Barbara's art and art architecture heritage. And um, I look forward to seeing the city to uh, grow in ways that will, um, will be inspired by our history. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Nicole. Hi. Okay. I just, um, I'm Nicole Hernandez, and I am the architectural historian for the city of Santa Barbara. So I'm going to present um, to you some more of the nuts and bolts of how to um, use um, the recently adopted historic resource design guidelines that are on our website from the city. And at the very end, I'll have a slide that shows the website for you. Um, 
we passed a revised ordinance in um, June of 2021 on historic resources with the guidelines to accompany them so that um, applicants can have a real guide and tool to how to create successful projects on historic resources and next to historic resources. And I know Anthony covered this really um, briefly, but I just want to reiterate which projects go to the Historic Landmarks Commissions, because I have experienced architects, planners, and even staff often ask me. All historic buildings go to the Historic Landmarks Commission, as well as new construction in the El Pueblo Viejo Landmark District. And it's sometimes good to remember that El Pueblo Viejo is a landmark district. Everything in there is united as um, one district, so it's considered its importance as a whole is really as important as its parts and pieces. And the ordinance does require if you're doing new construction or alterations not to a historic building, it be in the Spanish colonial revival, a Mediterranean style, or an adobe. So it doesn't even allow by ordinance um, going out of those styles if it's a new construction. Um, this is the map that Anthony showed you earlier that um, has all the his identified historic resources that have been identified and added to one of our lists and the outline of El Pueblo Viejo. If you click on these little dots on the parcel, most of them will have connect you to a report that will tell you why it's important, the year it was built, the architect, um, what the style is and why these things um, were voted to be protected by our city. I also, again, Cass, I think, showed this map as well. This is the GIS map that's on the city's website. It will also show you El Pueblo Viejo and all the historic districts, so you can find out if your project goes to the Historic Landmarks Commission. You can go to the guidelines and start early planning for a really successful design review and project. There is um, the one of the most confusing Parts of Historic Landmarks Commission and our historic purview is we have a state law called the California Environmental Quality Act that requires that any building over 50 years old, whether identified as historic or not, needs to be evaluated. And um, if it's found eligible as a historic resource, we will send the project to the Historic Landmarks Commission. So this is in conjunction with our local laws, but so if you have a, it's important to know if you have a project on a building that's 50 years old, or 50 years or older, and it's not been identified as historic, it still could be when it comes in um, for design review. So I, a lot of what we do is review these as they come in. So uh, the main goal for um, projects on historic resources for the Historic Landmarks Commission and for the California Environmental Quality Act is to not have a negative impact on a historic resource. This will give you a CEQA exemption the California Environmental Quality Act exempt. You will not need an environmental impact report. You will not need a de negative declaration. And to get that on um, historic resources or building next to historic resources, you need to meet the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic resources. If you meet those, you'll have your CEQA exemption and the HLC can make a finding that you meet them and approve your project. So, we have designed these guidelines to help you get that CEQA exemption, both on historic resources and building adjacent or additions to them. So these are the tool, and these were adopted by the Historic Landmarks Commission and Council to help you get you through design review as quickly as possible with a successful project. Um, so these are, this is the cover of the Historic Resource Design Guidelines, and they are on our website, and they are divided up by chapter. You do not need to take them all in at once. They're really designed so you can um, go to what you need for your project. The beginning of the, there's a big intro, and this is where you can go to see why do we preserve historic buildings? What are our policies? What are the different levels? What does that mean? It even outlines the design review process and what you can get for an admin approval, a consent, a review, or full board. It discusses preservation principles like restoring versus replacing, and it highlights benefits of incentives. So this is a good place to start with some of your beginning questions of historic preservation. I just want to highlight one of our biggest tools for historic buildings is a benefit, and that's the historic building code. I have many applicants and architects 
come in thinking that even on historic buildings, they have to meet Title 24. Historic buildings are exempt from that. So you don't have to meet the energy code. So you can retain the original windows and um, construction methods and materials. Also, you can keep archaic materials and methods of construction. So, um, and replace to match. So if you need to replace one deteriorated window, you don't, you can match it to the others. Um, like if, if it's a single pane wood window. Uh, also just so you know, we do waive all administrative fees on historic buildings for planning. Um, so that's another benefit of historic um, buildings. We're just trying to give as many incentives as we can, because we know that taking care of these buildings is a big undertaking. The second section of the resources is um, goes through the character defining features of most historic buildings. So we'll, there's a section on windows, doors, woodwork, plaster, roofs, chimneys, how, even how best to put solar panels on a building, a historic building, porches, balconies, and paint. Um, and it even goes through paint colors that are appropriate for different styles. I sort of focused a couple examples of this section on windows because they tend to be our most vulnerable character defining features of our historic buildings that um, have a lot of myths around them that we are trying to just give you some alternatives to. One, it starts out just describing the different types of historic windows. So, it, it, and then it goes into things like understanding the energy efficiency of a historic window, how you can make your historic window much more energy efficient and even cover lots of the costs versus replacing a window, um, just getting it right out there. In El Pueblo Viejo Landmark District, we don't approve any vinyl windows and we don't approve them on historic buildings. And this is sort of a photograph of why um, wood windows tend to add like a real depth and, and shade and dark um, light and beauty and as they have different patterns and the vinyl tend to be very flat and don't really um, speak to the window anymore. And I have a couple examples of examples of historic windows that had these put in. This project said these were like for like, and this is not what we consider like for like in the historic world. These are true divided like casement windows that were replaced with double hung vinyl windows without true divided lights. And you can see on a simple Spanish building from the 1920s, these really spoke to the eye and really made the building quite lovely. And without them, it became just more of a little um, box without much interest anymore. This building also had these um, recessed windows and true divided lights that really drew your eye into the beauty of the building. And when they put the vinyl windows on, it became very flat and it no longer had that play of light and dark that really tends to draw people's eye to the beauty of these historic buildings. So we try to match, when we match a historic um, element, we really try to match the profile configuration material. All those things need to go into it, which can tend to be very expensive when they have to be custom done. And to meet those Secretary of Interior standards for historic preservation on buildings, it does say that deteriorated features are required to be repaired, not replaced, unless they're too deteriorated to repair. And to get that CEQA exemption, to get your projects through, you really need to investigate repairs before we just go to replacement. And lots of um, times people have this myth that restoration is just going to be too expensive. And sometimes it really isn't. So it's worth to take the time to look into that. For example, I just had a um, project, an applicant had 24 wood windows on a hundred year old building, and it was only $250 a window to repair. They replaced the pulleys, reweighted the windows, replaced all the cracked panes, added new brass lockings and weather stripped and the whole project for 250 a window, which is way more economically um, viable than lots of replacement windows can be. So we, one of our most popular sections of our guidelines is additions and new constructions. And this really gives lots of illustrations on how to make those successful, because these are the kind of projects that usually end up at our full board. Um, so all the boards, even the Architectural Board of Review, the Single Family Design Board, and the Historic Landmarks Commission 
have to make a finding that a project is compatible with adjacent historic resources. So even if you're not going to the Landmarks Commission, you might need to use this section because you might be building next to one. And here's some tips that we have in there on how to do it. One of the biggest things is really location on the site, looking to really make the even um, sight line on the street. Sometimes if the building's too far back with like too much parking in front, it won't relate to a bungalow next door that has a front porch and no parking in the front. It will break up the pedestrian experience. And sometimes if they're too far back or too far forward, they overwhelm the buildings next door. Um, orientation to the street. Um, typically, historic streets um, all have front doors that face the street. And when you break that with like a solid wall with no front door and no um, interaction with the street, it really um, does not become as much of a lovely pedestrian experience. It speaks to the whole city. One of the best tricks to um, make a new building compatible with an old is um, mimic some of the roof lines. They start to create a rhythm on the street that our eye just automatically looks to and considers just um, really lovely when you're walking down streetscapes. Height, mass, and scale. This is such a difficult one in our tight city that's growing so fast, but it's really important to look through the guidelines and um, make sure you're not designing a building that's just going to overwhelm the buildings next door. And I have a, the case study coming up on how a big building did do this successfully. Using your fenestration, mimicking windows and window shapes along a streetscape really can create a, a compatible building. If you have a building that doesn't have a lot of windows, it starts to become stark and not relate to the historic buildings next door. Also in materials, like in this example, there's a stuccoed um, vinyl window building next door to a wood um, craftsman bungalow, and they don't really speak to each other anymore, giving really breaking up that streetscape again, and really trying to not look at your project in a tunnel, but looking at it, how it's going to fit in on the entire streetscape really is a, a great way to look at your building, because these will become walkable places, and most of us know how lovely it is to walk on a beautiful street all together. Um, we have a whole section on accessory dwelling units, which we have so many coming in. And one of the requirements is that, you know, it does need to be compatible if it's behind a historic resource. And there are some tools to help the accessory dwelling unit speak the same language as the front building. And um, I will go straight to this case study, how to be compatible with the historic resources and in the El Pueblo video. So this case study had three lots. Um, and one of the lots had this um, 1875 Italianate cottage on it. Um, this was the home of a Chumash family and it was a designated landmark. So they couldn't touch that. Um, so how do you make a Spanish colonial revival style or Mediterranean style building compatible with the 1875 Victorian building? And they really used almost all the tools they just discussed to do that successfully. Um, just so you know, the total project had 26 rental units and they restored the Victorian building to be one of those rental units and they had parking. Um, one of the tools they used really successfully is with creating even setbacks. So you see they, there's this even line as you come up and down the street so that you can really see how both buildings relate on the street and create this sort of walls of the street. The roof form, actually the, um, you can't see it as well in this picture, but the Victorian is a hipped roof, and so is the new building. Even though the new building has a terracotta roof, they both have the same shape, which creates a rhythm on the street. The new building used elongated windows, you can see, um, that um, followed the pattern of the Victorian. So it took its cues from just a few pieces of the Victorian and created another style. One of the biggest successful tools they took was using the cues of these long, elongated porch post and railing to create more Monterey style balcony. And then it was compatible with the newest building, which is the Spanish one on the end. And you can see the height and mass. I mean, this has many units of the big building, but they gave it some space and room from the historic building so that they could relate to each other. And actually it's only a floor story above the historic building on the streetscape. 
I just wanted to highlight closely some of the these chamfered posts, how they mimicked them from the Victorian building and to the new building. And then this building across the street, which is a 1920 Spanish colonial revival building that's historic, also has the post. So as you go down both sides of the street, you start to have this language that all starts to speak together. And this is looking up from the historic, the new building to the old and how they relate to each other, even though they're in different styles and different eras. And section four of our um, guidelines really goes into how the streetscape, landscape, and lighting elements, um, as Cass had shown you to look for inspiration. We have beautiful design elements all through our landscaping. And there are lots of um, sections in this that can help you do that and give you lots of ideas on how to do it successfully in Santa Barbara. Um, I think, yeah. And then we have a whole um, section on the historic architectural styles. There's 13 styles in this guideline and it really goes through the character defining features and why they're important of the different styles. So if you're going next to a Queen Anne building, you can look and say, what makes that special? Why is it special? Maybe those are some of the features you'd wanna pull out in your building, or maybe you're just trying to learn why your own Queen Anne free classic style building that you just bought is important. This can really help you understand that. We also have a whole section on our website um, with bios and buildings of different architects. Um, so you can look and if you know some of these architects that built these buildings or have a building built by them, you can come and see why they're important and what other buildings they have um, built. I'm trying to make this a very interactive portion because as I find more buildings, I add to the bios. Um, so the web pages we have where you can find the guidelines, it's um, santabarbaraci.gov backslash historic resource design guidelines. And the main historic preservation page that has the interactive map and the architects and the styles guide is santabarbaraci.gov backslash historic preservation. And um, we also have an Instagram post at, that you can follow at hashtag SB historic preservation where we feature several buildings a week, just different historic buildings, just featuring their beauty and why they're important and what year they were built if you're in, and it's just kind of a fun thing to follow. And that ends my presentation on the guidelines um, with a Victorian masterpiece that's in our downtown as well. Thank you. And I'll hand it back to Anthony. All right, thank you, Nicole. I'm um, gonna pop in really quick with a uh, pop quiz oh, yeah. for our audience. Give me a second here to share. All right, this is a good one. Okay, pop up. Okay, your pop quiz question, which of these buildings is not in Santa Barbara? Which of these buildings is not in Santa Barbara? Give everyone a minute to think about it. I thought there was only one that was in Santa Barbara. <laughs> oh, looks like uh, they can only see one and two. You should be able to drag the polls um, box around if you're having trouble seeing them. So it should be movable for you. It... Yeah, you can click and drag that poll box. It was blocking one of mine as well. The Jeopardy background music here. <laughs> All right, give it a couple more seconds. Think about it. Oh, 
All right, Anthony, I'll turn it over to you if you want to comment on these buildings. Sure. All right. Great. So um, looks like uh, looks like over 50% of people got it right with uh, number three being the one that's not there or not uh, not in Santa Barbara. Um, I, I believe it's uh, Los Angeles area, maybe Pasadena. Um, uh, so this was, uh, I think, the, the main point of this was slide was to highlight the fact of the range that we have in Santa Barbara of all these different styles. Um, and some of the other things you'll find in the guidelines are ways in which uh, Santa Barbara made each of these styles their own. And so what the, you know, even though we're we have a craftsman here on the on number four, uh, we're doing it in a sort of more Santa Barbara way than say Pasadena or other places. So, or Chicago or other, other places where craftsmen were built. So um, uh, the guidelines will also highlight some of those things that are unique to Santa Barbara about these different styles. And we don't just do Spanish clinical revival. So that was the other, other main point. Um, okay, great. All right, so now I'm gonna, uh, sort of close this last uh, portion before we go into Q&A. Um, I'll do a screen share um, and kind of walk through um, the uh, two types of reviews that, historic, uh, that HLC um, regularly reviews. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, so this should be up full screen now. Okay, so as we had, uh, as I had mentioned, um, you know, we have these the, the little historic properties outside of El Pueblo Viejo. And as you see from even the highlighted ones within it, there tends to be more large commercial or public buildings. Um, uh, and so they're, the, within El Pueblo Viejo, it's a mix of, of some single family design, some little orange ones you can see here and other, um, but also um, a lot more uh, commercial and public. Um, so first we're gonna go, uh, and so first we're gonna look at the historic side of things. Um, and they tend to be um, uh, more than anything else, uh, single family design. So, uh, you know, residential, um, at least originally designed as uh, for a single family. Um, this is an example of a Reginald Johnson, um, one of my favorites, um, and within the city. And this is his elevation for um, just working out the design for it. Um, so when we have these projects, these, uh, these single family and they're working with historic projects, um, First, we, the first question is, what are they, what type of, uh, how historic um, in terms of a, of a graded scale from historic inventory uh, to structure of merit to landmarks. So landmarks, obviously the highest, it's, uh, and it has to rise to that high level. Um, and it's also the one uh, core difference between it and the others is that landmark can't be uh, ever be demoed. Um, so. Uh, structure of merit and historic inventory um, with certain processes might be able to, but a landmark in, is always protected um, to the fullest extent because they're the best, the best of, of what we have historically. They also have to go to city council to be actually made a landmark. Um, um, historic Landmarks Commission recommends uh, to city council every year um, uh, projects that they uh, feel rise to the level of landmark um, uh, quality and status. And um, and then, this, uh, but it takes city council to actually um, actually make that decision. And then the next down the list is structure of merit. Um, and these historic landmarks uh, commission is uh, has sort of final say on that, and they can make them a structure of merit or not, and just within their their um, uh, full scope and, and purview and power. Um, and and uh, and then the the next the, the lowest level is the historic inventory. Um, these can be. Uh, the the um, city historian, right, currently Nicole Hernandez, um, can uh, just select pro properties that are obviously uh, of historic merit of some sort and can put it on the historic inventory. And they're basically just sort of, you know, earmarked that, hey, this looks like it's a, you know, a potential um, structure of merit, or it might just be, be contributing to the neighborhood. Um, and it's sort of just it has an earmarked um, um, property. All three of these uh, will still go before Historic Landmarks Commission and in the, in the same general judgment of how to work with it. So we're, we still use the same principles for all of them. The guidelines outline, uh, the historic guidelines outline those. Um, so the same rules apply for all, but the landmark they just apply to the highest level and the historic inventory, not as much. Um, okay, so, uh, so for, for looking at those historic, in this case, we're gonna say single family design projects, the ones that come before us, um, 
the first part of that is reviewing their thorough history of the project. So this might include drawings you might have, or the, that are at the city. Um, the city historian might will prepare um, some sort of a report, or you can, or you may have to have a hired uh, from the approved list of historians, architecture historians um, of the city, uh, hire a historian to do a full report. Um, and so there's a report associated with it to analyze it photographs and sort of all the information that you can have and, and might have from the property um, to, so that we know what's been changed. If, if, we, if we can know, we know what's been changed, added, subtracted, what it was originally. And the more things are changed, the less integrity they have in general, it lowers their status and quality and might remove them from as a, even on the historic inventory that might be taken off altogether and deemed not historic in any way. And, and in which case they would go to single family design uh, board for review. There's still a design review board, but it's just not Historic Landmarks Commission as a design, design review board. Um, so then uh, another factor is the thorough understanding and documentation, uh, documentation of all the all sides of the building, as well as details such as doors and windows, roof pitches, um, so what the slope of the roof is, the eave overhang, all the different conditions and character defining features. So having lots of pictures, every side, um, as well as you know, uh, drawings of, of what what uh, you might as the applicant want to be doing uh, with it, but existing drawings of the building as well as um, you know, all the information. Um, another key thing we see uh, oftentimes we don't get is, uh, especially in the first rounds and, or first visits, is neighborhood massing and historic street uh, urban setting. So uh, under, an understanding of the neighborhood, it's not your, and as Nicole had touched on for a number of the um, uh, sort of ways to add and um, add to buildings. The neighborhood compatibility is important and also has, is an important condition to understand where all your neighbors are, um, where their setbacks are, how their building masses, masses are, are there patterns on the street, uh, planting patterns, everything. So as much information as possible. Um, and then um, to continue on the single family design, so successful addition methods are addressed in the guidelines. But in general, additions should be on the size and back, especially the back. Um, and that's done because not all projects are viewable from the street, but in general, most of the projects tend to be viewable from the public street or public right away. And so that's the most important view with, for Historic Landmarks Commission to consider because especially if you can see it. Now, some are set way back and you can't see it, they're off the street. And, um, but usually the, there is a front and it usually is the most important side of the, of the, of the building, the, of the structure. Um, so we recommend in general to be adding towards the back. Um, and then also, uh, it's also recommended to do it on areas that have already been changed. So if there's already been a whole giant remodel of one side of it, um, of the building, that's the, typically the better side to be adding to because things have already been changed. It's already lost its integrity on, on that side. Um, so that's what we encourage. And then also we like to see matching of the existing language um, of the historic structure, including use, the use of the historic building code. Um, so there's also certain advantages that you can use the historic building code of both interior and exterior, matching doors and windows, like um, especially things like single pane or, or, um, or the window patterns is important. Um, and then I just included a little uh, detail just to show you that, you know, it's not just historic landmarks and the commission requiring this, but you know, all the old drawings, all the, you know, from, from uh, as old as architecture is, um, the details are worked out and thoughtfully worked out and designed. And so it's important to be able to review um, all the details, even though the curl of a bracket and the size of bars and um, of, of wrought iron, so. Okay, so now that's kind of the, the single family historic house project. Now we'll look at larger projects. So larger projects and, uh, we're not going to deal so much with larger historic buildings that you're working with, um, uh, although the, some of the, most of the same principles would still apply, adding towards the back, that, that trying to set back as much as you can from it, um, and addressing sides that have already been um, sort of messed with and, uh, and uh, don't have their integrity. Um, but really, we're, we're going to address, look at, in this case, looking at larger projects in El Pablo Viejo. Um, they'll oftentimes usually be around historic buildings, so they need to work with the historic building, um, but they're not actually, um, most of the time, they're not actually a historic building themselves that's being added to or, or um, modified. So, um, okay, so the, in general, the, a successful project follows these steps, in, in most of, and some are just required to follow all of them, 
um, except for the first one. The first one isn't optional. Um, but this is the sort of the general sequence. Uh, successful projects also tend to go fairly quickly through these sequence uh, rather than staying on the same review over and over and over. But that can happen. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about with that with each one of these. So the first step uh, is, a, is an optional step, which is what's called a one-time pre-application. There's no planning review. So for those of you who don't know, there's the planning department and there's the building department. You have to get through both, but you start with the planning department and it looks at things like parking, setbacks, um, uh, all the basic planning, overall mapping, density with housing, um, uh, all those requirements. Um, and then uh, once you get through most of that process or all of that, for the most part, all that process, you can go on to the building department and then you have to satisfy the California building code and all of that, what that entails. And there's a lot more detail of those drawings to, to satisfy that and structural and mechanical and all those things. So that's the kind of two divisions. For the, all the design review stuff is all one, steps one through five here. So it's all about getting through the planning process. The building department is its own animal and we're not really gonna, going to cover that, but we're gonna acknowledge it because that's where you eventually get to once you get through the planning department. So with option one uh, or with um, step one, uh, this optional, it's really helpful um, to get a gauge on what Historic Landmarks Commission is going to find, whether in general, especially the mass, bulk, and scale, which we looked at at one of those early slides, as what one key thing for neighborhood compatibility and just overall good design. Is this pleasing and does this make sense, um, this, this particular building, whatever it might be, um, in terms of its overall mass, bulk, and scale, and how it addresses the street and how it relates to its neighbors? Um, so this is helpful, this, this optional one-time pre-application, but there's a you know, big asterisk here. There's no planning um, uh, review ahead of time. There might be a little bit, but there's no official full planning intake and thorough review and catching all these things that might, you might have to do um, and setbacks that you might have to follow or other things that, um, that might be uh, potential problems, which might be really big problems that would have you change your whole design. So you've got to be a little bit cautious, careful with this, but it does allow for initial, before developing a whole huge massive set of drawings, an initial quick concept review to see if in general you're in the right, uh, going in the right direction with your design and whether it seems like it's supportable by Historic Landmarks Commission. So that's the step one. Step two is first full planning application and HLC review. Um, and then we'll get into each one of these after that uh, in, in a second here. Um, Three is, sent, is then sent to planning commission for comment if, if it's required, if this is a required step. Some projects do, some projects don't. Um, I have to go to the planning commission um, for comments. But uh, the projects, um, most projects are, um, it, it's coming through HLC as the, um, as the official review body and it's going to planning commission for comments. But um, HLC is the final decision maker on it. Um, so then it comes back to us afterwards after the planning commission has analyzed it for uh, the number of units and the density and the parking and all these other things. Um, and if there needs to be a height exception or if they're asking for a height exception to go to planning commission to see if that's supportable. So there's all these things that needs to go to the planning commission for, and then it comes back to HLC. Um, and it comes back for step four, which is project design approval um, or PDA. Now this is the real big one um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but then after project design approval, it's basically the five, step five is final approval, and that's like the nitty gritty details are being worked out, and other things are being sort of massaged and pushed and pulled a little bit. But the overall massing stays the same, the overall design stays the same, and really final approval is working out the, the approved design. Um, uh, as a note uh, on step four, project design approval, that's the first appealable action. So um, that's the first time that anyone can appeal the project, whether it's a successful, whether HLC approves it or not. Um, that, that's, this is the step at which that it goes to, uh, um, and, and as the appeal body is, is city council. So it would be appealed, whether it was approved, whether HLC approved it or HLC denied it, either decision could be approved or appealed to city council. Um, and then after final approval, uh, then the last is, is building department submittal. So you're, you're most, you're maybe halfway there in terms of your building Per, uh, department the middle set when you get as you're getting final approval you're working out a lot of the details and your engineers are going on structural mechanical electrical everything and they're developing all their sets um, and then finally at the very end you handed a massive set to the building department for full middle 
Okay, so we're kind of kind of skim through these now. Um, the one time, so we're going back to the beginning, one time pre application. So it's one time review, a little planning uh, department oversight, as we talked about. Uh, get initial feedback, it was a gut check for HLC. Um, you have a site, and so then typical drawings include a site plan of the whole site, floor plans, elevations, perspectives, sketch renderings. Um, and then also, what's good to have, oftentimes people don't have, is their inspiration images, where the, what they're drawing inspiration from, especially if there's, they have good historic buildings that have, you know, great or are, are highly inspiring, as, as you saw from um, Kath Ensberg's um, uh, presentation. There's a heck of a lot to be inspired by in the city, and especially really great historic stuff. Um, and that's always very helpful for projects to have a lot of their, their inspiration boards. Um, and then also have a neighborhood mass and compatibility study. This is also important to get an, a, a real handle on your area of the neighborhood because Historic Landmarks Commission, one of the findings that we have to make, um, we have to say that we find that this design is compatible with the mass height, bulk, bulk and scale, as well as also finding it um, neighborhood compatible. So we have to be able to say that um, and make a motion to that. So, you know, help with that by doing initial studies of the neighborhood and showing how your design would fit within that and be compatible. Um, and, uh, and, and so in that, the more you have for this information, the better, and the, the easier it is for the Historic Landmarks Commission to be able to make that, those findings. Um, and know that they're, they could be comfortable with that. All right, so then step two, um, but it's the first full planning application and, a, and the actual real review. The, um, the one we talked about before was, uh, was basically a one-time review. It's no guaranteed planning, you know, the plan, planning has not fully reviewed this, these sets of drawings. Um, so it's very limited in terms of that. Um, and so that's its own just sort of one, one-time application review. Once you have a full submittal, and you, you know, have a full planning um, package submittal, then it goes before us for being able to actually make, um, oftentimes be able to actually make a motion for things. And so now it's really, it's, it's a real serious full package. So you have initial planning review um, comments, uh, planning review and comments or from the planner, from the assigned city planner, additional feedback from HLC, especially regarding math, bulk scale, and neighborhood compatibility. And a lot of these are, are repeats of the other ones. You have site plan, floor plan, elevations, perspectives, sketch renderings. Um, you should have uh, information images again for this one as well. Um, have neighborhood massing compatibility study, including views from the street as well as aerial. So that's a regular requirement, and I think it's good practice, at least at a basic massing level, for architects to come in with having studied the overall massing of their neighbors and the block and their, or their surroundings and really how their building's gonna fit within that and fit comfortably within it. And the more that they do this ahead of time and front load this study, usually there's less surprises when you go to get the review board because you've already seen it yourself and you realize, ah, oh, that's kind of hot tall there or that's a little close. Uh, maybe it needs a little more breathing room or maybe it needs to scoot forward or backwards or wherever. Um, and then the other factor we always end up asking for is height comparisons for the neighborhood. So might as well do it ahead of time. Look at your biggest buildings, your smallest buildings, and get an understanding of the neighborhood and be able to show and speak to that. So I thought that an example of kind of this general level um, is good here um, uh, to see. And so you see it's you know, artistic, it's to scale. Um, it gives it the idea of the building pretty fairly well in elevation. Um, and then we, that we ask the applicant to come back with a 3D mapping model to show us uh, how it looks with this, you know, curved wall here along the street corner and here and here. We're worried about uh, being able to see, how, you know, pedestrians and traffic and how this corner, it has a drop and, and how, how it might, you know, relate to the corner. Um, we also wanted to see how the garage would work. And it, we tend to not want garages, the mouth of the garage sticking out close to the sidewalk, and so that becomes a, a regular comment that we oftentimes have. Um, so we asked the applicant to come you know, uh, back with this masking study, and this is what they came back with, which allowed us to look at that curved wall here in the corner. But you see how different in three dimensions what might be an elevation that looks like, you know, here that's very tall with a two-story and all this. But what realize, the, oh, no, this is set back, the wall here, and you can really get a feel for what that would actually feel like in the street. So it's very helpful. It's very helpful to get good judgment on a design um, so you don't have comments that actually either weren't necessary because um, in perspective and in three dimensions, it's not actually an issue, 
or it really is an issue and um, it's not until you draw it in, in three dimensions and perspective that you realize it. So it becomes very a very helpful tool. And it doesn't have to be a really fancy rendering either. It doesn't have to be a perfect colorized and, and with all the details worked out perfectly. It can, it can be a, a, on the simpler side and still do the trick. Um, all right, so then I sent the Planning Commission for comments, which provides VH such as height and parking. Um, and then the project returns to HLC as the decision-making body with the Planning Commission comments, which we then bring up in the meeting, discuss, and it becomes part of what influences our, our decision. Um, okay, and then finally, or not finally, but then next step is project design approval, PDA. So this is the first um, appealable decision, as I mentioned. Um, and this is mass, height, bulk, and scale. This was a recent project just this last week uh, that got rave reviews and got project design approval. Um, it went through the process exactly like the steps mentioned. It was first it did initial um, application, initial um, consult, off the optional one. It got feedback. It, uh, they reacted to that feedback. They uh, tweaked their design, changed things a little bit, adjusted the massing, um, and then went on, came back for the actual application. Um, uh, we liked it then, um, and they, they, uh, we had a whole list of additional comments to address but we still were liking the direction it was going. And then they went to planning commission. Plan planning commission was very supportive, including the height, uh, they, they broke the height restriction. Um, and, but it was a design thing that was a higher roof and, and we were in, in favor of it and planning commission was as well. So it was great. And so they came back with a good positive comments from planning commission and we just you know, did one review and they were approved. And so now they're gonna be coming back probably along the way um, for um, before they get to final approval because there's an awful lot of details and things like that. So oftentimes architects come along for interim reviews just to say, this is what I'm thinking for the balconies and for this and for that, and these are for colors and that, and get a sign off on elements along the way so that as the mechanical engineer starts you know, figuring out ducting or other things, um, as the structural engineer might need more or less space, then they can be adjusting their working drawing, the, the, their bigger picture drawings uh, for the building department without having to come to us and then us saying, oh, well, can you adjust this or move this uh, because it would be better design-wise. So um, they come along the way and um, and that, that's a, a successful thing. And then the final is or the final approval is the, the final thing. And then once they get final approval, um, they're really already well underway for engineering. Uh, their, their set is growing um, by the pages and, you know, in the 50 plus page level. Um, and uh, especially for any decent sized building. And then, um, and then it's gonna go in, it's getting ready for the building department submittal. Um, and so then they're, they're getting final approval and then, you know, whatever a month or two later, they're submitting to the building department um, with all, with their full set of uh, drawings. And then this is an example of architect uh, Jeff Shelton that I'm sure all of you know, or most of you do, um, and his, you know, construction details for, uh, you know, spacing of windows, um, and um, you know, and, and all of his fun, fun little uh, details that he then zooms in on uh, for final approval um, along the way. So, um, and then finally, it's building department submittal, and um, and then there'll be mul the building department submittal. There'll be multiple rounds of plan check comments. It's going to take a long time. Uh, it's going to take you know half a year ish plus um, typically, and um, then finally the building permit is issued, and then you can start to build. So. All right, so with that, um, let me stop sharing here. Um, so that kind of concludes where, where we wanted to go with our presentation today um, and uh, sort of show you all these various pieces and things and, um, and tips and tricks. And Sarah, I don't know if you want, or Kevin um, to, uh, yeah. So go on to the, net, the last segment. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. So we've got 10 minutes here to open it up to a Q&A discussion. So we've got some questions already coming in. Um, apologies in advance, we probably won't be able to get to every single question, but we'll do our best. So for this first question, um, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. The question is, can existing historic buildings, historic district buildings be reconfigured to become housing rather than retail office space? Hi, yes, we um, do not review use at all. Um, that is a zoning issue. And we've been looking at it a lot. And I know we've had a lot of developers look at it. It is 
pretty difficult actually to change the use um, from commercial to housing because of all the plumbing required. You know, you have to put in, say you're taking the old Macy's building. The Macy's building just had one little section for bathrooms and you have to replumb the whole building. So each apartment will have a bathroom. And then you have to have egress windows um, added to the building. So yes, and it's been done successfully in many cities and in many projects. But it is a challenging, um, especially with like the department stores, which are some of the buildings that I think of right now that I think they're massive enough to put in um, housing, but they, there's a lot of challenges. Whereas, you know, many of us think of like downtown San Francisco or LA where um, they were able to turn old warehouses into housing, but those had tons of windows. So it just depends on the building and, what the developer is willing to do to make those changes. But we are completely supportive of that. And as far as historic, we adaptive reuse is one of, considered one of the best things to save a building. And actually, uh, just if I could jump in for a second, because I saw another question coming on chat um, that kind of related in terms of demo. And that's good. it is good to point out, um, so any building that's going to get demoed within um, EPV needs to be reviewed by the Historic Landmarks Commission. And in general, historic resources, for sure, um, is we always want to see what else can be done as, as aside from demo. Um, so uh, and anything that rises to any historic um, level, the landmark landmarks just can't be demoed at all. Period. So that's just, it, just that's a non-starter, and, and, and yeah, so you, you just can't can't do that to a landmark. But I do want to I did want to bring up this because that was raised in in yes. the chat. And I would follow up on that if you demo even a structure of merit or something on the historic resources inventory, it requires a full environmental impact report um, through the yeah. California Environmental Quality Act. You will not get that CEQA exemption. That is a negative impact. <laughs> so yeah. it's very, very difficult. It's at least over a year of public review for an impact report. And so. and without and without knowing that you'll actually get that in the end too. And and you know whatever tens or uh, uh, yeah, high high tens, if not hundred thousand dollars. So uh, it's it's much much better to try to figure out <laughs> a nice way to use it than to than to waste time uh, trying to go end around. So. Yeah. All right. All right. Another question: uh, We've got a watcher who was watching the city council hearing on the future of closing State Street downtown, but no one mentioned how the parklets would be evaluated under HLC guidelines. Any of you speak to that? Um, well, yeah, the, the parklets have been a, a thing that, um, or as a temporary measure, is, is kind of a, a gray area of, of where things are and where things are going. But I know there is um, there's a lot of discussion behind it, and um, so I, I didn't I didn't want to get into the details. I haven't, I haven't seen the city council meeting, so I don't yeah. want to comment too much on it, but. Um, there we did, and actually, Kath, even before you were on Historic Landmarks Commission, volunteered uh, with a group of 10 to 12 architects with the AIA and landscape architects, really a community effort uh, to come together and come up with a basic standard way of doing parklets that was not, uh, you know, massive structures from Home Depot uh, stuck in the middle of State Street. Um, so, uh, and, and come up with a way of still getting signing and, and pretty much the same amount. Um, uh, and, and in an organized, beautiful way um, with simple tables and, and umbrellas and scansions and, um, and planters. So um, I, I know that that is, that is part of the standards, um, uh, but I think that there's going to be more conversation, hopefully, um, and discussion and hopefully um, uh, discussion at HLC with this, because it, it seems pretty obvious that um, it's not going to go away anytime soon. So uh, we should make it look good. Um, yeah, and especially moving forward, I think um, for new new ones coming in, there are standards being developed that with the input of the HLC, as Anthony said. All right, thanks. We've got another question in the review process. Is workforce housing seen as a priority? Is workforce housing? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and um, 
It is seen as a priority. It's recognized as such, as are all, like, another good example is solar. Is solar seen as a priority? Yes, solar is seen as a priority. Uh, Historic Landmarks Commission recognizes that very much. Uh, we had a, a big solar uh, project on top of the, um, the parking garage across from the um, courthouse that has wor uh, that slowly worked through. That was a, it was a struggle, but it got through uh, um, with design. So what always happens is there's these competing interests, right? So uh, you, there is a solar. We're all for solar. We're all for sustainability. We're all for workforce housing. We're all for housing in general. Um, we're all for all all the good. Um, we're all we're for hotels and the and the um, uh, you know have, having a good vibrant. Um, tourist in the industry. That's part of where what our the you know the code at the beginning that I read to you was um, an importance of it. We're, we're for all these things, but we're not um, for it, and it's to the point where we ignore all the other things that we have to review for. So I don't know if Kathy wanted to add any more to that. Oh, you're on mute, Kathy. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, um, I would just add that. Um, really the, the, the number of units is not something that we get into. Um, the, that's up to the developer to decide how they're going to meet the requirements of the ordinances uh, with respect to the housing. Um, that's, not our, that's not part of what we do. Um, and Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that we don't uh, comment on the, um, the number of units we're, we're concerned with the aesthetics and with how it fits within the neighborhood and how it fits within the community as, as a general rule. And we like, you know, uh, uh, children and dogs as well and plants. Yes, all of that. That's why we're concerned about the neighborhood. <laughs> we yeah. want to make sure that it's a livable place. And I think one of the big struggles that that we're all having as a community and uh, we talked about this at our last hearing is how to be an existing good neighbor that you already live there and how to be a new neighbor coming in to be a good neighbor how do we work together to have uh, the best that's going to be the best for all um, and how do we transition from a, a higher density like like state street and the um the streets adjoining and then as we move very rapidly down into these neighborhoods that surround these old neighborhoods that surround our city that are all generally one and two story houses res you know single family residences for the most part although there are some apartments and and various other things too but they're smaller scale so so this is the trick this is the design challenge this is the puzzle how do we figure out how to um, creatively and aesthetically um, make it all work um, and which I think every architect should be very excited about figuring out that that Rubik's cube, if you will. Mm -hmm. Fun. Yeah. It's a fun part of the work. It's finding out how to make it work, and we have so much inspiration to help us. You know, the answers are everywhere. There's many yeah. answers. And, and just to be a little bit of a jerk about it, um, <laughs> uh, we <laughs> uh, to the extreme version of this. So uh, I think we, you know, at UCSB, the Munger Hall um, conundrum uh, and, and issue, uh, we could just take a whole block of State Street, wipe it out and do a Munger Hall there. And, you know, there, there's our housing. Um, but, you know, that's the obvious extreme other end of it where you put, if you put one thing above and beyond everything else. So we need to balance that between what all those needs and, design, and importance of that, but also keeping the quality and livability of the, of the city at that high level. So everyone gets a window. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. And we've hit 7.30. So thank you all to um, our panelists and to our viewers for those great questions and participating throughout the entire presentation. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for coming to the special Zoom panel presentation and have a good rest of your night. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.